Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhishek Vemuri, and I'm co-chair of the National Affairs uh, Planning Committee and the Committee on Lectures. And it is my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speaker. Uh, before I begin, uh, I have some uh, sad news to report. Uh, I'm very sorry to announce that Mr. Tom Porbear, Vice President of the Pine Ridge Ogallala Lakota Nation and a leader in the Native American opposition to the proposed Keystone XL pipeline, uh, cannot be with us tonight because of a medical condition. We are working actively to reschedule him later this year. And so for tonight, we are incredibly happy to report that uh, Ryan D. Thompson, a Nebraska farmer and rancher who became a vocal opponent of the Keystone XL pipeline, is able to join us. Mr. Thompson is, by his own description, an accidental activist, out of a concern that his land would be condemned for the pipeline. In support of his efforts to protest uh, the pipeline, uh, Stand with Randy events were organized all across Nebraska, and uh, they were quite successful because uh, his land is no longer threatened by the new proposed route for the pipeline. But he still continues to speak out about how the pipeline threatens other Nebraska farms and ranches. So would you please all join me in welcoming our guest, Mr. Randy Thompson. Thank you very much. I want to say this, folks in Iowa really know how to give a person a reception. I certainly appreciate that. And I want to thank the Senator, the National Wildlife Federation, and of course Iowa State University and all the folks connected there for the opportunity to be here tonight. Let's just say this is somewhat of a unique position I find myself in. You know, it's not too often that a fat boy from Nebraska gets a chance to be at an, something like this. So I certainly appreciate it, that opportunity. Uh, before I commence, I would like to introduce one person that has been very special to me, and without her, I couldn't have done the things I have done. And it's my wife, Sherry. And I don't know where she's at. Probably not going to stand up. She's clearing the back. <laughs> but truly, this is about the first trip that she has been able to come with me. And without her support at home, I just couldn't have done the things I have done. Well, I have been quite active in the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline. And he, he kind of stole my line, you know. I was going to say I became an activist at a very old age. Kind of sat on the sidelines till I was 60 years old until this issue uh, confronted me. And I guess people might wonder why I have spent nearly five years fighting against this pipeline. And there's a lot of reasons. But the people I really blame is my parents. They're the ones that instilled this in me. And it's because I know what they went through. Because actually the property, just to go back, backtrack a little bit, the property the pipeline is going to go through was my parents' farm. So the fact that I knew how hard my parents had worked to get that farm has really driven me and made me stay in the fight. I'll tell you a little bit about my parents. They got married in 1933. My mom was all of 16 years old. I think dad was like 19. And there was another couple, they were about the same age, only that girl was 14. And one day, they decided to get married. So mom and this other girl skipped school that day. They went to a neighboring town, they got married. They came home and they didn't tell anybody for three months. And you know, I'm sure you think, geez, they got married awful young, probably didn't work out. Well, it didn't work out very good. Mom and dad were only married 71 years. And the other couple, 60-some. But anyhow, my parents spent seven years, when they first started out farming, 
they did not raise a crop. Of course, that was during the Great Depression and the drought. <clears throat> and, you know, they survived somehow. I don't know how they survived it. I don't think they ever really knew how they did it. But they did. And that's the kind of people they were. I remember when I was a kid, we did not have electricity. We did not have a bathroom. I mean, that was a pretty exciting day. I was 12 years old when we got a bathroom. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. And my parents struggled for years. They rented farms, worked hard. And eventually they got to the point where they could buy some land. And this was a great achievement for them. And so it's my knowledge of knowing how hard they worked that has kept me in there. You know, I never saw anybody wearing a $4,000 suit out doing chores for my parents. And when those people come and tell us they're going to take our land, well, they're going to have a fight on their hands. So that is what has happened. And this all started back in uh, about five years ago. In the fall of 2007, we were approached by TransCanada. And maybe I should ask, are you all aware of the pipeline who's involved, TransCanada, and all this, because otherwise it might not mean very much to you. Does anybody would like me to just briefly explain the pipeline? Or Okay. I'm just going to give you a rough outline of, of what's involved in this project. <clears throat> the Keystone XL is a pipeline that will run from Alberta, Canada, down to Port Arthur, Texas, 1,700 and some miles. It's a massive pipeline. And it will be carrying a sludge or a solution of tar sands oil, which is very thick, very gooey substance that they dig out of the ground up there. And then they have to dilute it with chemicals and run it at a very high temperature and a great deal of pressure to get it to flow through the pipeline. And personally, and I think a lot of other people, I'm sure a lot of other people, would tell you that the real purpose of this pipeline is to get that Canadian oil to a place where it can be sold on the world market. And that's going to increase the price of that oil because now they only have the United States to look to as a customer. This would open up the world market for them. So this, in essence, and by their own admission, is going to raise fuel prices in the Midwest. So when you hear these people talking about it's going to lower fuel costs, that's BS. That's just plain what it is. So that's just a very brief summary of what the pipeline amounts to. So back in 2007, the company building the pipeline, called TransCanada, came to our place, and they wanted us to grant them an easement across our land so they could put this pipeline in our ground. It would only not only be buried in our land, but in our situation, we have a very high water table, <clears throat> so it would actually be submerged directly into our water supply. So they wanted an easement, and I want to just speak briefly about easements because the easements involved with this project are of a critical nature to landowners. Basically, an easement is when you give someone else a right to use a portion of your property. 
for example, if you had a neighbor who wanted to have a driveway across your land, you could grant him an easement for that driveway. And this easement most always becomes a permanent part of that land. Now, in the case of the Keystone XL, the easement would last for 99 years. So this is something that not just my generation would have to deal with, but a lot of future generations are going to be faced with this. And of course we know that the older these pipelines get, the more problems they have. So I wasn't, you know, I'm not really too excited about signing off on an easement that I know that future generations are going to have to deal with. So you might, uh, you know, you might say, well, it's just an easement across your land for a pipeline. Is that just going to take up like eight or ten feet of your property? Well, no, it's a little more than that. Because the permanent easement that they wanted is 50 feet wide. And then they add on what is called a construction or a temporary easement, which is another 60 feet. So they want 110 feet to work with because they have massive equipment and it takes that much space to get it in there to put the pipeline in the ground. So what this means to, an, to a landowner, if you give them an easement, when they come and start construction, they have the right to rip up a strip of land that's 110 feet wide. Well, if you're unfortunate enough to have, say, some wooded or forest areas, or say like a vineyard, something of this nature, when they come, they're going to tear out a strip of land that's 110 foot wide. So when they're done, when they leave, you're going to look out there and through your trees, you're going to have a gaping hole. It's going to be 110 feet wide. And in some cases, I know people that have vineyards and they're going right through the middle of them. So there's not a whole lot left. And the sad part is you can't come back and replant those things on the permanent easement because TransCanada now has the right to that property and they, they want access so you're never going to be able to grow trees there again. So it's going to be a permanent scar on your property. And if you farm the ground, you're going to have a lot of problems, guarantee me. You can plant crops on it, but needless to say, if this big heavy equipment, it's going to compact the soil. So you're going to have some problems with that. And then you're going to have sinkholes and all types of things. If you have pasture land, now all of a sudden you've got this big strip of dirt right through the middle of your pasture and you may have difficulty with access because you have no grass growing, it may have to be fenced off. I mean, there are just a, a multitude of problems that go with this. Now, of course, the company says, we'll take care of everything. Don't worry about it. Well, you know, like I said earlier today, I haven't believed in the tooth fairy for a long time. And I've heard too many stories and talked to too many people who had problems with this. So that's definitely a concern. The other thing that concerns landowners is the fact that this easement stays with your real estate. It can drastically affect your property values because I'm sure any of you, if you wanted to buy a piece of property, would you buy one that had a huge big pipeline in it full of chemicals? Or would you buy one over here that was unencumbered with no easements, no problems? Which one are you going to buy and how much money are you going to spend for it? So that is definitely a concern for landowners. And then, of course, 
we have the little thing like leaks. Pipelines do leak. And this is not your garden variety pipeline, believe me. This is massive. It's bigger around than I am. And that's pretty big. <laughs> Seriously, it is three foot in diameter, which is about like a hula hoop. And it's going to be pumping at 1,400 pounds of pressure. So when I think about them digging a trench four foot, or, well, they have to dig the trench seven or eight feet deep because uh, they want to bury it four feet under the ground. So it's going to be sitting right in our water supply, at least on our farm, and a lot of places in Nebraska. That's the reason that water has become such a concern and such a topic of discussion. And so... You can imagine a pipeline inundation that will be pumping, like I said, about a million barrels of this sludge every day through our land and our water. Any type of a pinhole leak at 1,400 pounds of pressure is going to do some serious damage. And they cannot detect pinhole leaks there's a certain percentage that they cannot detect. And even if they can detect and shut these things down, do you realize that the shutoff stations are 17 miles apart? Okay, how much oil is in that 17 mile pipe? So they shut down everything on both sides, but it's leaking oil out of that section of the pipeline how many thousands of gallons of oil could seep out of that thing? Well, anyhow, because of these concerns, we said, we're not interested. We don't want any part of this pipeline. And so we refused to sign an easement. Well, TransCanada tried just about everything you can imagine to get us to sign that agreement. And we refused. So then they resorted to the intimidation factor. And so in uh, July of 2010, we received the first of two letters that TransCanada sent us. And they said, here's what we're offering. You have 30 days to accept it. If you don't, we're going to take you to eminent domain court. Okay, here's the interesting thing. Evidently, I know, they did not have the authority to use eminent domain. They were still in the application process. But the letters served the intended purpose. And a lot of people did sign. And it, it is intimidating. <clears throat> I mean, how many farmers and ranchers are used to dealing with a huge multi-million dollar corporation? You know, and, and no offense, Rob, but they got a zillion lawyers. I mean, this is intimidating to people, so a lot of people sign. I guess I was just stubborn enough. But we got the first letter. I really did not know if they had the power of eminent domain. But I was stubborn enough. I basically said, you know, you can go to hell. Well, they didn't do anything about it, so I guess they didn't have the power of eminent domain. But a year later, they tried the same old trick. And they sent us basically the same letter. And, <clears throat> you know, I had a little, bit of, a little bit of fun with these letters because most farmers and ranchers, for some reason, they don't want anybody to know what they were offered, you know. They don't want the neighbors to know. It. I don't know. It's just something that farmers are that way. 
But I thought, you know what? I'm going to let the public know what these big-time spenders are offering farmers and ranchers. By that time, I had quite a few contacts in the media. So I started firing off these letters that they sent us. People were astounded. The very first offer TransCanada made us for a 99-year easement. One-time payment, 9,000 bucks. Going across 80 acres of our land. And I'll tell you what, I know people that signed for $1,000. I mean, it's just ridiculous what these people did. Well, they kind of kept up in the ante a little bit. And so the last letter we got they had upped it to $17,900. I calculated this out, and I figured, okay, we got $17,900 for 100 years. How much is that per day? About 50 cents. So they're paying me a half a cup of coffee for the right to pump a million barrels of this sludge through our property. You know, that doesn't seem like a really good trade to me. I've done some horse trading in my life, and believe me, that wouldn't be a good trade. So anyhow, that's kind of where we ended up. Things got really quiet. I didn't hear a whole lot from them. But they had a habit of calling me all the time. And, you know, I kept telling them, I said, you know, there's no need to call me. You don't have a permit. If you ever get a permit, you call me back then. But that didn't change them. They just kept a coming at me. And I had some, what you would call, frank discussions with the man. Well, <clears throat> May 23rd of 2011 was the last I ever heard from them. You see, that day, my mother passed away in the morning. About an hour later, who calls me? The Trans-Canada representative. He said, Randy, we'd like to come on your property and do a little survey. Well, I'm not even going to attempt to say what I told him. Let's just say I haven't received any more calls from TransCanada. But to kind of top the thing off, went to mom's funeral. My sister-in-law was over there looking at the flowers. And all of a sudden, she really gasped. She said, oh, my God. So I went over there. I said, what's going on? She said, look at this. Flowers from TransCanada. I told the mortician, I said, I want these in a dumpster in one minute. So you could say we haven't had a really close relationship. Well, it appears now that our land will no longer be on the route. With the latest change I've seen, it looks like we're going to be 15, 20 miles off. So we kind of got a reprieve. But unfortunately, so many other landowners, and now a bunch of new landowners in Nebraska, are faced with this same situation. You know, the, there's just hundreds of people that don't want these easements. And why would we? You'd have to be out of your mind to want this massive thing in your in your land. So it, so now down south at least <clears throat> in Oklahoma and Texas the president is okay to permit to finish that portion of the pipeline. And so TransCanada has the power. They have the power eminent domain now. And so the folks down there are they are under siege. 
and it's really sickening. I don't know if any of you have heard about <clears throat> what happened last week. There's a lady by the name of Eleanor Fairchild. I have met her personally on several different occasions. Eleanor is a 78-year-old widow. She's a great-grandmother. She has a little ranch down there that she and her husband bought. Well, TransCanada got the power in a domain, and so they took, they got the easement across her land. They told her before they started any type of construction that they would notify her. Well, one day last week, she looked out the window. Here's these big bulldozers and excavators, and they're ripping her trees out. So here she is, 78 years old, and I tell you, she's pretty spunky. She went out there and stood in front of the construction equipment. So you know what happened? She no longer had the legal right to be on her own land. TransCanada called the sheriff. He came out and arrested her, and they charged her for criminal trespass on her own property. Unbelievable. You know, I, I really wish that, you know, we hear a lot, of, a lot of rhetoric about all the benefits, supposedly, of the Keystone XL. But I'd like to see some of our politicians stand up and tell Eleanor's story. Let's hear them talk about that. But they don't want to talk about that. Because, indeed, those are ugly stories and things that should not be happening to American citizens. But I can guarantee you, after what our state legislature did, they weakened our eminent domain laws in Nebraska last spring. Personally, I think it was, it was a blatant attempt to help TransCanada move forward with their project. So now, once they get a route approved, they can get eminent domain. So they can come into the state of Nebraska and start condemning Nebraska properties when they don't even have a permit to build this damn thing. I mean, how ridiculous is that? And yet, 45 of our state legislators and our governor all signed off on it. I mean, you talk about throwing your citizens under the bus. There it is. Plain and simple. You know, we can, we can blame TransCanada for what they're doing. It's, you know, it's terrible what they're doing. It's sickening what they're doing. But, you know, we really can't blame them in a way. They're just like all big corporations, or most big corporations. They're going to push this as far as they can. They're going to take whatever we allow them to take. And unfortunately, our legislators are letting them take whatever they want. So I think we need to seriously look at what is happening with eminent domain in this country. Now, I'm sure, I mean, we've all heard of some other pretty scary situations where individual citizens had their property rights stripped by companies, private companies. You know, TransCanada is, it's a private company. It's, they're not out here building an interstate highway that's good for everybody in Iowa, Nebraska. They're not out here putting in utilities, gas, electricity, things that people need. No, they're building a pipeline that runs straight through our country right down to the port. There's not one spigot that I know of that's going to be in Nebraska. So how do they qualify for eminent domain? Our legislators, they have to get their heads out. 
because that's where they are. You know, they, they have turned the dogs loose on American landowners. And I think this is a story that needs to be told. And so that's why I'm here today. I want to tell the story, what's happening to American landowners, American citizens. We should not be subjected to what's happening. A foreign corporation coming into our country and somehow manipulating the political system so they can take our land. They can force their will upon us. You know, I have never seen an asterisk in the Constitution by individual property rights that says these rights are only good until someone rich and powerful wants to take them away from you. But that's the way it's being interpreted, and that's what's happening. So hopefully, we as citizens can do something about it. Thank you very much. I would be glad to field any questions. I guess we have time for that, Pat. Yes, sir. I think she's going to grab a mic. I wonder if you could uh, say a little bit about the uh, location of the pipeline for our benefit, uh, like where it's located relative to Ames, sure. Iowa. I'll... Okay. Um, it's kind of in, it started out running across diagonally. I don't know if you're familiar with the sand hills of Nebraska. And that's what really opened up the can of worms. I mean, when they decided they were just going to drop this thing across the sand hills, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that's a really bad idea. <laughs> you know, but the sand hills route was probably, it runs at a diagonal, but I would say about probably 150 miles west of the Iowa border. Um, and it's still going to be relatively close to that. They aren't moving that thing very much. You know, they're saying, oh, yeah, we rerouted it and all this, but actually only added about 30 miles. And they really, they haven't gotten out of the sand hills yet. And there's no way they... It would go across I-80 at about York. Real close to York. It's where it would be, and then it would, it diagonals down, and it comes down to southeastern Nebraska, ends up at Steel City, which is in southeast Nebraska, right on the Kansas border. So that's kind of the location of it. But, you know, they picked the worst spot in the world to put the thing, out there in the sand hills of that sandy soil. You know, if you tear up that sandy grass, you may never get that replanted. I used to work up there in the sand hills on some big ranches, and you know, if you weren't careful, you could get stuck in a four wheel drive pickup real easily. Because the sand would actually blow around, and it, it would look like the, the surface of the moon almost. You'd have huge craters called blowouts, and you could never get grass to grow in those things. And so, you know, the people up there worked for years trying to get that grass established and keep it from blowing away. And now these clowns, they want to come in here and rip up this whole area and think it's not going to blow away. I mean, that's the problem. The, the people making the decisions on this, they're sitting in a desk somewhere 1,500 miles from here. They, they wouldn't know the sand hills from this floor right here. They have no clue. 
and yet they're the people making the judgment whether this pipeline is safe or not. They never once, when they first did the environmental studies, no one came out to Nebraska and put boots on the ground. They had no clue. And then, you know, I read the original environmental statement. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like something my 12-year-old grandson would write. You know, they say things like, um, well, if TransCanada contaminates the water for someone or some community, they have agreed to buy bottled water from those people. Wouldn't you love to get up in the morning and take a shower and <laughs> then you take a few couple hundred bottles out and start watering your cows? <laughs> of course, you know, it only take about oh, probably 30, 35 bottles per cow. That'd give you something to do all day, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, this is ridiculous stuff. And then they say, there will be some economic positive economic benefits when the pipeline leaks because repairmen will have to come in and fix it. <laughs> so the community is going to benefit from those guys being there. This is the logic we're working with. Let me tell you, this is not Nebraska and Iowa logic. This is like, well, I guess it's Washington, D.C. logic. Plus, the people that did the environmental statement come to find out they were close associates with TransCanada. Anyhow, yes, sir. All right, uh, thank you for your comments on the eminent domain problem. I was actually not aware of that, so that's a very important issue. But the issue I want to ask you about is your water supply there. Yes. It sounds like your water table is pretty high. And, but how deep is your well, and are you actually in the High Plains Aquifer at that point? And if so, what, what are your thoughts about that whole contamination potential? Because from what we've read from our end of the state, um, I think a lot of that has uh, risen up to a fever pitch and then kind of died down because people thought maybe it wasn't as big a problem as they thought it was originally. So could you comment on that? Sure. Our irrigation wells are about 20 foot deep. Ooh. Our static water table is from four to nine feet, depending on the time of year and how much irrigating is going on. So if I go out there and dig a post hole in the spring, for sure, I'm gonna hit water with a post hole digger. So they're gonna bury this thing four foot in the ground. They're gonna have to pump water out of the trench to get the pipeline in there. And that has been one of my huge concerns from day one. The fact it would be buried literally in our water supply. And that's why I'm going back to these pinhole leaks and stuff. Easily contaminate our water supply. So, uh, yes, I mean, that's a tremendous concern. And you, you might end up pumping those on your crops, too, right? If it's irrigation, is in the irrigation well in there? I'm sorry? Would it be pumping that stuff on your crops if the irrigation well was at that same depth? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it would, make, it would basically ruin our property. I mean, you can't irrigate with it. In our, our sandy soil there, we can't raise a good crop unless we do irrigate. And also... Uh, you know, this thing would be just a few hundred feet from our irrigation well. And in addition to that, we have a livestock watering well right in that very same area. So if it contaminates our livestock watering system, what do we do then? And the bad part is our land is actually on a big island. It's right part of the Platte River. Uh, okay. <clears throat> it's about 12 feet or 12 feet about 12 miles long and about two miles wide, this, this island. So, you know, if it's going to leak in our property, all these river undercurrents will immediately pick this oil up. And away it goes, down the Platte River. I mean, these are huge concerns. 
How much would it cost to drill a new irrigation well if you had to move it? Well, you know, if they contaminate it, I don't know how far you'd have to move it, but you're probably looking at, I don't know, 20, 30,000 anyhow, maybe more. Good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. How many um, cities downstream from York or where this would cross the Platte River are still drawing water out of the aquifer, the uh, Oglata aquifer? I mean, wouldn't it pollute on downstream to those cities that are drawing their water? Absolutely. And, you know, Actually, like the city of Lincoln and the city of Omaha, they draw their water from the Platte River. That's where their wells are. They're down in the Platte River bottom. So, I mean, that's almost a worst case scenario because it could be contaminated from oil, you know, quite a ways upstream. Um, and one thing about the aquifer itself, as you go further east, the water table becomes much deeper because, and the, and the land is heavier. So like in eastern Nebraska, well, I live kind of in eastern Nebraska myself, and our well is like a couple of hundred feet deep. So we got 200 feet of dirt between the pipeline and our water. And out on the farm, it's buried right in there. So, you know, that's why the people in Nebraska started out, we said, move the thing east, you know. It, it may still be over the aquifer technically, but we have this huge barrier in between. It's not gonna just contaminate it right away. But, you know, TransCanada has just absolutely refused to move it. They just won't do it. So, you know, and I thought this was a crazy idea when I first heard it. But I'm not so sure anymore. A lot of people really believe they're insisting on staying out there because they want, at some point in time, they're looking at our water. And that water, in fact, one of the TransCanada representatives said one day, well, we could pump water through it. The slip of the tongue, but he said it at one of the hearings. So it's making a lot of us wondering what really is coming down the road on this thing. Yes, Steve. Randy, what's the safety track record? of a pipeline like this, or what has been the safety track record of the pipeline that's been built in Canada so far? And also, could you maybe highlight a little bit about what the actual tar sands extraction process kind of looks like? I mean, I don't need you to go into depth, but you know, what, what does it really look like before? I know you're an activist on the pipeline itself, but what does right. the extraction process look like? Well, you know, I'm, gonna, <clears throat> I'm not an expert on that, to be honest with you. Um, I can tell you this, they're going to tear the hell out of everything when they do it because they're ripping these mountains down. And, but it is a high pressure type of extraction system of some kind. And maybe Senator knows more about that actually than I do. I, I have seen a lot of pictures of what, what the landscape looks like when they get done getting this stuff. It looks like the surface of the moon. Only it's got big toxic ponds on it. In fact, these ponds, these tailing ponds, what the water that they use to get this stuff out is then thrown into what they call a tailing pond. And they're absolutely toxic. They have to have warning systems on these ponds so the birds don't land on them. Because when the birds do land on them, they die. A couple years ago, one night, like 500 birds lit on this one tailing pond because their, their uh, siren didn't go off, and those birds all died. This is kind of stuff it is. So I don't know if that's a very adequate description. Uh, you know, I'm not real familiar with the exact process with the extraction of it. 
But I do know it's a very tar-like substance that will not, it's, it's just like asphalt, kind of. And so it has to be diluted with the chemicals to get it to flow through the pipe. Yes? Given the ecological ramifications of this, um, I like to follow the money. Do you have any comments on who's profiting from um, um, getting this pipeline to go across our country? Okay, uh, thank, with thank you for that question. Who's profiting from the pipeline? That's a pretty simple answer. I know the answer to that question. <laughs> it's multinational corporations, oil companies. I mean, we have got owners of, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. The countries that own a share of these oil companies that are up there in this big oil bonanza. I mean, there's a lot of different countries. And <clears throat> so they're the ones profiting. I mean, this oil... Like I said, it's going to basically flow right through our country. And it's going to go down to Texas. And it's going to be sold to the highest bidder. Now, I guess the United States could still get it if we want to be the highest bidder. But what's wrong with us? Right now, we're the only customer they have. So why wouldn't we keep advantage of that just a little bit? Because they do have pipelines down to the Midwest refineries. But instead, good old U.S. government, we decided to give them a big break and let them pump it across our land and risk our resources. And we don't charge them anything for coming across. And we don't charge them anything down there in the tax-free export zone. They got a pretty sweet deal going here. But the simple answer is, it's a big oil companies. And you know, they got the politicians out carrying the water for them. They're all out here telling us how wonderful this pipeline is. I mean, you would listen to these guys talking and you would swear to God, you know, this is the holy grail, this pipeline. It's gonna solve all of our country's problems. These few thousand temporary jobs, they're gonna solve our unemployment problem. And this oil that's flowing across our nation on its way to some unknown destination, that's going to make our country more secure. That's going to solve our energy needs. I don't think so. Thanks for your question. What is the current status of this project and what uh, chances are there still of stopping it. I heard someone say the other day, I don't know where they got this from, but I heard someone say that someone from Canada had said that this project is dead already, that they're still trying to fight it, but there's no way that it'll ever get through. But, but uh, I don't think you sound like you believe that. What do you know about uh, what there still is to do to stop it and how likely it is for it to happen? Okay. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, they kind of broke this pipeline in two segments now. And the president gave them permission to finish the pipeline from Cushing, Oklahoma, on down to uh, Texas. Because that did not require a federal permit to come across the border. Okay, the northern area that would come from Montana down through Nebraska. They have had their permit denied, you know, last January. So they have reapplied. And that's where it's at right now. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, that's why we're really in a limbo in Nebraska. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I would say this, I'm never going to give up on this thing because we've had so many 
times over the past five years when we thought, there's no way we're ever going to get this thing changed or get anything done. And by golly, we have gotten some things done. We have gotten some things accomplished. But I think people have to become aware of what's going on, and then we have to do something about it. And, and that is kind of what has helped us a little bit, is the fact it's kind of got drug out here for almost five years. You know, the Trans-Canada guy, when he first came out in 2007, he said, you better get this signed. He said, I'll tell you one thing. A year from now, we're going to be pumping oil through your land. Okay? So, I'm not giving up. Now, if Mitt Romney gets elected, this is probably game over. And I don't want to make this into a political thing. I'm a Republican. Have been for 40 years. I'm not proud of it right now. I'm not proud of our Republican Party because they have had, they've been the ones with the extreme push to get this thing done. Our own senator our own congressman, Lee Terry, he's been one of the main forces in trying to get this thing rammed through. Just get it done. You know, I guess he thinks, you know, the hell with the folks in Nebraska. I don't know. It's hard for me to understand. Right. <clears throat> I don't know if you're aware, but TransCanada already has one pipeline that goes across eastern Nebraska. It's called the Keystone. And it was put into operation, I think, three years ago. Well, the first year, it had 14 leaks. And there was one leak up in North Dakota that shot a geyser of oil in the air 60 feet. It was on a rancher's place. I talked to the rancher. In fact, he came down to Nebraska to one of our events that we had. And he actually spoke about it at that event. Well, he saw this geyser of oil shooting in the air, so he called TransCanada. And they said, well, this is just a hoax call, isn't it? He said, no, you got a leak here. It's shooting, it's shooting oil way up in the air. Well, he tried and tried, and he finally, I guess, got him convinced. Well, then they shut it down. It spilled 21,000 gallons. And so then after that, they poo-pooed his story. They called him basically a liar. And he told me, he sent me an email not too long ago. He said, you know, the sad thing is, the regulators are trying to cover it up just as much as TransCanada is. So, you know, who's pitching and who's catching? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Have you had any success with getting politicians to get on your side for, like, um Recently, when Obama blocked the northern pipeline, was that any part due to activists like you? Uh, short answer, no. We have had no success with Nebraska politicians. We've had one or two strong advocates for us out of the entire legislature. You know... Uh, no, we haven't had anybody really step up to the plate. You know, Senator Johans, when TransCanada was pulling all this stuff with these letters and they were trying to bully people into signing these agreements and all that, I had a chance to visit with him about that. And so he did come out with a public statement, and he said, I think TransCanada needs to quit bullying our citizens. And that's the strongest statement from anybody, really. You know, the rest of them, in fact, there was a, a man when they were wrangling around about the route, 
this guy drew a cartoon, had it in the Omaha World Herald. And it showed all of our legislators lying on their backs in a row. And it said, and there was a Trans-Canada representative who said, does this help you any plan out the route, you know? <laughs> I guess that's been my most frustrating thing. It just, you know, it's just like, Five years ago, I believed in our system. I would never believe this would ever happen to me because I thought, especially our state government would take care of our citizens. But it's been just the opposite. I mean, I expected to fight with TransCanada, but I sure didn't expect to have to fight with all of our legislators, you know, just over common sense things. But, you know, they spent $550,000 in lobbying when we had the special session last year. So I guess it pays off, huh? Some places, I don't think it would with this gentleman. I'm going to take him home with me. And then we'll have five senators that we can count on. Any other questions? First off, I'd like to thank you for informing us about this. I was unaware of a lot of this going on. Thank you. Um, is there any other way to try and get our voices heard and make an impact on this situation, uh, aside from just talking to representatives of that sort? You know, I've always thought, and I used to always say, you know, we need to talk to somebody who can do something about this. We need to talk to our politicians. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's the answer. I've talked a lot of them. We've all talked a lot of them. You know, I think it just has to be, it's going to have to be a citizen grassroots movement to get anything done. And they're not going to listen to a few people. So, I get, you know, I don't discourage you from contacting your politician because no doubt it has to somewhere sink in we're not liking what you're doing. And so, but if you can, you know, hold events, whatever, on campus or whatever, you know, just to show people, we don't like what's happening here. We don't, we don't like the idea that the foreign corporation is taking our American citizens to the eminent domain court. You know, maybe when some of the political guys come through Iowa, just ask them, say, uh, well, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the people that are being drug into eminent domain court for this project? Instead of telling us about the benefits, tell us about the people that are putting their lives on the line for this thing. So I think we just have to really open a discussion. Thank you. Thank you.